to all of uh, all of my subscribers um, and we kicking off uh, our new year with uh, with George Bushney who was a, uh, a technician in the Rhodesian Air Force um, George by the way I'm not too familiar with all the different squadron numbers so if you Kevin. you know yeah so you were seven squadron okay I'm familiar yeah, with that one <laughs> so so George was a chopper tech uh, but George and I have actually been friends for almost 50 years we both went to the same church when we were youngsters and uh, so I've known George from before I joined the RLI and uh, during my time in the RLI um, uh, Tienz Engelbrecht and George Bushney were good friends of mine in the church youth group and uh, and that's where we that's where we we struck up a friendship uh, George thank you so much for your time uh, over to you my brother well thanks uh, John I'll endeavor to tell you my story <laughs> Uh, uh, unfortunately, my uh, original uh, flying logbook, uh, my uh, stepmother uh, threw it away. Uh, right, and yeah. uh, so I've got to rely on my memory, which um, uh, ain't too good nowadays. But when I was um, 17 years old, which was the case of just about all the young Rhodesians, we were off to the military just as young boys and uh, I remember the day when I got into the Viscount from Bulawayo heading to Salisbury my dad gave me ten dollars which was the most money I'd ever seen and I thought <laughs> boy this is going to be great so I arrived at New Serum we were introduced to the uh, uh, RSM uh, which was the SWO in Air Force uh, terms uh, which is the station warrant officer, whose name was Barney Barnes, and uh, he is known uh, very well to the Air Force people, and uh, we lived in absolute fear of him. <laughs> and uh, basically, uh, having gone into the Air Force, uh, we were now on a crash course of um, learning how airplanes uh, worked and uh, learned our trades and also at the same time to be uh, trained as military people and a discipline where some people had more discipline in their bringing up than others but uh, after a while we all knew the meaning of discipline otherwise we knew the consequences <laughs> and um, so for nine months we trained um, our uh, various subjects and I went in as an, an engine uh, fitter. So I learned uh, in the nine months all the theories on jet and piston uh, engines, which I might tell you was, was great. I really enjoyed it. And um, it, it um, stood well for me for the rest of my life in the learning that I actually got there. From uh, after nine months training at the ground training school, we headed off to various sections and squadrons um, uh, to start learning. And we'd be three months here, three months there, and just learning a bit. And sometimes uh, if we like something uh, a lot, we, we might have the opportunity of pursuing that squadron or section. And I went into a place called ERS uh, for about nine months, which... Um, I really enjoyed rebuilding um, Canberra 
uh, engines, which was an Avon 1. I then was uh, taken to 5 Squadron, which was the Cambrus. Uh, I think we had about oh, six or seven Cambrus that were uh, uh, flying. Uh, they had uh, problems with the main spa cracking. So, um, you know, we had to be very careful and gentle on the old birds. And being on the squadron, you meet the senior guys, they teach you, um, and you have a, a great lot of fun with these guys. So uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my time on five squadron. Um, then I was posted to three squadron, which is the, uh, the, uh, the Dakotas or vomit comets as we knew them. Um, and we uh, learned how they worked and, um, and they were a hard work uh, on a Dakota. And uh, I soon became an engineer and had to fly wherever the Dakotas would fly. Uh, just like Tian Singelbrecht, um, he was one and I was one. And we'd fly around to all the locations around the country, dropping troops, dropping uh, uh, various materials, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I remember one of the early flights that I did, uh, we were doing a thing called Sky Shout. Now, Sky Shout was a big speaker at the back of the Dakota with the open doors. And there was an African uh, fella from uh, the district commissioner that was the spokesman. And around Darwin, there were a lot of uh, terrorists running around and they wanted the locals um, to not um, uh, support them any way, but uh, to um, let us know where they were so that we could go and uh, sort them out. And uh, while we were flying over, all of a sudden, I just heard a few hits in this aircraft and man, I jumped. And um, with that, I went to the back to see if everything's all right. And there, uh, a mate of mine, Cliff Rose, who was the radio technician to make this all work, he came out of the toilet running up uh, uh, to the cockpit with his trousers at his feet because he'd just been shot at, uh, the round came through just over the top of his head, uh, and he didn't know it at the time, but uh, uh, he, he thought he had been shot for a while. And I thought, but that's funny. I thought it was me. And then the guy, uh, the African guy who was giving the message on the sky shout, he says, I'm about to die for my country. Now that really invigorated the tears to give us a real snot squirt. Uh, and uh, we got rounds coming at us from all over the shop. We went and landed um, at uh, Mount Darwin and uh, there were quite a few shots all around the aircraft. And I went and I looked under where I was sitting, the engineer seat, and I saw a round that had actually come where I sit. And I thought, that's what I, I, I heard. And I went and I looked at where my toolbox was. I lifted my toolbox, which I was sitting on top of. And there, a hole had come through uh, the aircraft and through the bottom of my toolbox and into my spanners. So fortunately, my spanners slowed down everything and uh, we got the guys from um, uh, ASS in uh, Salisbury to come, the senior guys the following morning and they came and did an inspection and gave us a one-off flight back to um, uh, Salisbury. And this was the first... Uh, time an aircraft had been shot in the Rhodesian Air Force uh, on three squadron at least. I don't know about other squadrons at that stage in 1974. And when we arrived and landed on the runway, they had all the fire engines out, everything. And I thought, wow, I deserve a medal after this. And we landed and all the brass were there. There were tons of people there. And uh, everybody inspected and took the aircraft and, uh, and, and um, did all the inspections and then the, re the repairs ensued. This was the time where in 74 that the war in earnest started. While on the squadron, I had the OC tech, uh, Derek Utton come around and he came onto the squadron to see me. Uh, and he said to me, I want you in my office. 
um, I want to talk to you. So I went there and I thought, what have I done wrong? I've never been to OC Tech. So I was fearful that I'd done something wrong. So I got in there and he said, look, the uh, South African um, Air Force, uh, which was operating uh, uh, to help us in Rhodesia, had about 12 uh, alouettes. And um, the United Nations had declared that they had to get those aircraft, uh, I mean, they had to get out the country immediately. So he said to me that I just volunteered myself onto 7th Squadron because 7th Squadron was a voluntary squadron only and for sergeants and above. And there I was a, a, a corporal and I never volunteered, but I was on the squadron for training. And uh, there were about uh, a dozen of us that went in for training. And uh, for two weeks, we learned all about uh, um, how a helicopter uh, flies and the basics. But, you know, when you're young and you're not even um, a, a, a journeyman yet, and you've got to learn everything about a helicopter in two weeks, it's a bit, it's a bit much. And uh, so... There we were taught for two weeks about a helicopter. And then I was told, go and get your kit, get in a Dakota, uh, you're off on your first bush tour. Now, I didn't even know what a terrorist looked like. I didn't know anything. But, man, my heart was racing all the way there. And we landed at a place called Bowley. I don't know if you're aware of Bowley. Um, and um, that, that was a very sandy runway we landed on there. And the good news for me, there was no helicopter to pick me up. So I thought, well, perhaps I can get in the deck and go back. And uh, so I asked the pilot, I said, uh, no chopper. He says, yes, I know. He says, you're going to have to wait here until the chopper comes and collects you. And I thought, in terrorist country, I said, by myself? He said, all by yourself. <laughs> so I, 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 I was uh, very fearful about this. And then he said, no, hang on, we're going to wait. They, uh, there's a contact very close. Uh, they're about five minutes away, and then we'll swap over technicians. So the te uh, we swapped over, and the pilot was very excited that we'd on their trail and we were just about to go into contact. And uh, he was excited, and I was very sad. Um, uh, going into such, uh, something that I'd never um, knew much about and that was so dangerous. So anyway, um, a K car came and I was put in the K car. Now, I didn't even know how to shoot. Um, how do you load this thing? And I told him, I haven't a clue. So we swapped over with another um, Alouette and a senior tech got into the K car and I was with the G car. And guess what? We go into uh, uh, the the area, and um, who sees the tears first? Me. And we were uh, flying at treetop level, and I thought, hang on, if I tell the pilot these guys are going to shoot me, uh, we too low to the ground. And then I thought, oh well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. So I said, bang to the left. I've seen them, and he said, well, take them out. So we blasted into these guys. And then when you fly with an alouette, there's a low warning light for fuel. And when it starts flickering the yellow light, you hit uh, the stopwatch and you've got 10 minutes flying. But it gradually gets brighter and brighter and brighter. But in the beginning, it flickers and it's not very bright. And after firing into the enemy and then fighting back, um, I looked at the instrumentation and I saw the yellow light not flickering, but bright yellow on. And I said, yellow light bright. And he said, oh, man. He says, right, we're going to land. And there was an, uh, an RL uh, truck, army truck that had some fuel on board, which was about 300 meters away. So we landed there. And uh, while we were landing, you just hear all the rounds uh, 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 being shot around you. And uh, I said to the pilot, right, are you helping me to fetch the, um, the uh, drum of fuel? Now, this is 200 litres of 44-gallon drum. You've got to go and grab, uh, bring it back to the chopper. He says, no ways. You're going all by yourself. 
And um, he took my FN because I can't handle the drum and the thing. And he says, I'll give you cover. So I sprinted there. I, uh, I actually pulled the uh, drum off that uh, truck that was a lightweight with all the adrenaline flowing and <laughs> rolled the thing back to the chopper. And I knew very little about how to refuel. And when I uh, opened up to refuel, there was no cable to start the motor. It just wasn't there. And I thought, how do I do this? So I took my boot lace off and I tied a knot. And um, I knew nothing else but to pray. And I prayed out to God to, to help me. But I mean loud, above the gun shop uh, uh, um, a noise. And she started. And I refueled it. And he ran back. Gave me my FN, we get, got back in the aircraft and we flew around. And uh, after about 30 minutes, uh, all the choppers came and landed in the same spot to refuel. Now, one of the guys on the ground, uh, the call signs on the ground, actually said they would saw us land and they moved away to come and give us some protection. And they saw as we were uh, uh, um, hovering, uh, taking off, uh, there was a group of curs that uh, were firing at us and they shot them and, and kept them down uh, away from us. And he said, you guys were very fortunate of making uh, that alive. Uh, so I went to one of the senior techs and I said, please, can you show me how to refuel properly? So he went and um, um, got my uh, uh, lace and tried to pull forget it, it wouldn't start. So with that, he said, right, let's strip it. So we stripped it. And then the governor was totally bent. He says, my word, you were very fortunate starting this. I said, my word, you were. So now we got it started. Now we put it into the drum to suck the fuel out to put petrol in the chopper. Guess what? It won't suck. The seals on the pump were leaking air. And so the fuel was uh, not passing. So um, we tightened up uh, all the fittings and there were one or two uh, O-rings that we had around that uh, did it. And now she was refueling. Now, at that time where I prayed out to God to help, he not only got the motor running, but the seals were uh, uh, working and the enemy never got to us. So I did three things all at once. And I know some people would say, uh, you know, that's just uh, one of those things. But uh, to me, I believe differently. Um, and so that was my beginning of being on a seven squadron. And uh, I can tell you, there was a lot of fear being involved. And we went back to Chiredzi. And when we got back to Chiredzi, I was so pleased to see one of my friends, Beef Belstead, there. Um, and uh, so it was so nice for the next two weeks we flew around and when you have contacts and that you land on the ground and you talk and that, and at least I knew that I had a senior tech around if there were problems and all the rest. And then the one night, um, I'd only been on the squadron about two weeks. Uh, we were uh, called out to where they thought there was um, uh, sightings, but we couldn't see them. And being a G car, um, we went back to Chiredzi because we didn't have the same fuel that the K car had which beef was on. And as we landed um, at Chiridzi, I was just refueling and uh, getting my aircraft ready. And a pilot ran to me, he said, get a 44 gallon drum in fuel, get it in the back. And we sprinted. Now it was getting twilight. And with the uh, Alouette, you flew with maps. There was no uh, navigational systems. You had to fly with a map. And he said to me, I've got bad news for you. So I said, oh, what's that, sir? He says, uh, your friend Beef Belstead has just been killed. And my word, I froze. And as we went, we saw his chopper on the ground. But there was a lot of trace coming at us as we were coming in. Um, and I just saw green trace all over the show. And we landed, uh, took the drum out and uh, another... Uh, new guy on the squadron, Nick Salentis, uh, came over and he helped me roll the drum over and he had to bring that other chopper back uh, with beef uh, uh, dead. And um, when, when we landed, 
we took off uh, with the chopper now running uh, and um, we had to do, um, diverge all the, uh, the um, activity of the TERS going towards where they were refueling uh, the K car. So we were being shot at heavily. And I can remember going up into a little ball in the back, uh, thinking, how am I going to survive this? Uh, and eventually we got up and we, we managed to survive and get back to Chiredzi. But now I knew for sure this was a real war. This was dangerous. And uh, although I was fearful before with every contact that we went to, and I was amazed how many in a day that sometimes you got to. And uh, one thing to say uh, on our squadron, we were a very busy squadron. We had to uh, deal mainly with fire force, but uh, if there was SAS, um, externals, the police, internal affairs, uh, a road accident on the road, a Kazabak, we had to do it all. And so uh, we were a very, very busy um, a squadron. Um, yeah, so I, I can remember flying and when you come into a contact, flying there is okay, uh, you, you're relaxed. But the moment you get into a contact zone, the first thing um, that happens, you get into an orbit. And when you get into an orbit, uh, you're flying at about, I think, 78 knots uh, and uh, you're about 500 feet or 700 feet above the ground. And that's where you start shooting from. And the uh, mask, I could uh, 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 um, smell the vomit coming up from my stomach that uh, um, when you start getting into the thing, because you, you're really tense, that's happening. And when you hear there's an RPD there, oh my word, now you're really uh, tense because that was my worst nightmare was when you find out that an RPD was there because of their fire rate. And, and so, you know, I, I, I came in and I can remember we, we had this uh, uh, contact and my stomach was churning. And I tell you, you want to put 15 baboons out. And so um, I, I told the pilot, look, I, I really need to, uh, to go from the contact zone. Uh, I'm going to cut myself here for sure. So anyway, he says, okay, let's go. So we flew about four or five Ks from the contact zone. I go behind a tree and I let it go. and then. As you know, there's no toilet paper anywhere. So I look and there I see something green. So I thought, oh, good, I can wipe it with the leaves or that. But I didn't see it clearly. So I grabbed it and I pulled it and I wiped my backside and it was stinging nettles. My <laughs> word. Did that uh, uh, burn me uh, for the next hour or two? Um, and then I had to use my socks and that was uh, all, all clear. Um, as the years went on to the, um, the squadron, you, you start getting more um, confident because one of the biggest fears when you're flying as a chopper tech is what happens if something breaks down and I can't fix it. So the longer you're on the squadron and the more snags that you actually have, it gives you more confidence. But I can tell you one thing, those Alouettes were very, very good aircraft, and they gave us very little trouble. Um, I was in a place called Matoka, and uh, um, we got wind that um, we uh, actually um, had one of our senior <coughs> crews. Just one second, John. Sitting, in, I was cleaning my aircraft in Matoka, um, and all of a sudden, a pilot who I wasn't flying with, John Blythe would say, how much fuel have you got? So I said to him, uh, I've got 400 pounds. And he said, right. He said, let's get going. Um, or 300 pounds, I've forgotten, uh, uh, whatever the amount was. And he had a doctor with him and got into my chopper and we flew off. And some blokes on an OP had noticed the chopper flying and then all of a sudden it crashing. Uh, right on the main road and we got there and he spoke us onto it 
And when we got there, we couldn't find this chopper. For about five minutes, we flew around, and there we found a few things. It had disintegrated and scattered all over the show. And we landed, and we went to go and find uh, where the, the pilot and tech was. Eventually, we found the pilot, a very experienced, good pilot, Mike Mulligan. And there he was in his bulletproof chair upside down. And with it being upside down, his uh, bulletproof vest had come and hit him underneath his uh, throat and he was breathing out his uh, uh, throat and the blood was just going onto the ground. So we picked him up slowly, put him on a stretcher and put him into the chopper. But now we couldn't find the technician. I found him about 250 kilometers, uh, 250 meters away. And he was groaning his back. Uh, he broke his back. So we put him onto um, a stretcher and we were heading back to Salisbury to the Andrew Fleming. And on the way, the doctor was pinching Mike Mulligan all the time because he was fighting. And uh, I said, why are you doing that? And he says, this guy's fighting for his life. And then we flew into rain and he said, hey, we can't have uh, uh, the rain going on to him. He says, go and stand on the step. So I flew, uh, while we were flying, I was standing on the step uh, um, so that the um, rain wasn't reaching him. And with all the blood and swelling around, it was all over me, but the back of me was all wet. And we landed at uh, Andrew Fleming. And when we got out, uh, they came out with their stretches and collected um, him and, um, and Bob Fletcher. And they also took me because of the amount of blood. They thought I was also injured. And I said, no, 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 no. So uh, anyway, we thought that he would never fly again. But two years later, he was flying. He was a remarkable uh, 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 pilot, as so many were. There were, in a war, as all know, there are some terrible things that you come across and atrocities that you come across. One of the worst that I ever came across, we flew to a place called Katio Tia State. And at Katio Tia State, there were um, these terrorists had gathered up the farm workers, and there were about 15 families in a row the fathers in the front, the mothers behind, and the children behind them in a row. And um, we were told to get there. And when we got there, there was mourning like you'd never seen uh, the crying. And the terrorists had killed all the fathers and left the mothers and children. And I just saw this and it was something that I've never forgotten. And I took my visor and I pulled it down and I was crying. And I saw, as I did it, the pilot pulled his visor down. And he said, right, it's time for us to go and sort these guys out. And we went and we called for fire force and um, uh, fire force were about 40 minutes away. So we had to contend for ourselves. But uh, unfortunately it was a big group and they even had an anti-aircraft gun. And um, so uh, there were about 60 of them uh, against us only in the, in the G car. And um, we ran out of fuel. And we, there was a fuel station on the road, a shell uh, um, a fuel station on the road where we landed. And uh, we landed there um, to get some fuel because with an Alouette, you could fly a small amount of hours on diesel. So cut the motor and we asked the petrol attendants to push the chopper to the, uh, to the fuel bowser for diesel. So we put in 200 liters, and once I'd finished the 200 liters, um, the petrol attendant said to me, right, so he says, where are your fuel coupons? So I said, <laughs> there's no fuel coupons here. Uh, I, I said, look, just tell your boss uh, what happened. He will understand it. But fortunately, as we were pushing back, he arrived. And he said, get going, get going. He says, I know what to do. He says, no problem, carry on. And uh, we, we uh, carried on on our uh, diesel. George, where was this? Katia T State. Was it Chipinga area or? 
no. Um, you know, my memory is so bad. I think it was Hondi. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, 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 and the Hondi, no, Hondi are, Valley. There, there are two uh, states uh, there. Yeah, the uh, Burma Dengana. Valley as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, it wasn't Burma there. And that's where we were. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, as a chopper crew, that uh, going around the country and all that, you felt uh, as though there was always a, a lot of support that would be there not to, uh, uh, for a time if uh, you landed into trouble. Um, but I remember some of the externals that we used to go into Mozambique and uh, where there could be 12 or 14 and, and with some of the bigger ones, uh, every single chopper in the Air Force uh, went into the external raid. And I remember this one, uh, we all gathered and um, we filled up and we went. And as we went into the, uh, the base camp of the terrorists were, man, the Canberras came in, the hunters came in, and there was one almighty uh, um, uh, smoke and and noise and all the choppers flying and the guys on the ground. And while we were looking, I was just looking at the trenches and in the trenches, you see the, the gun cabinets and the everything. And we got around that hit us and I didn't know where it was. And we started to fly. And as we were flying back to Rhodesia, because we didn't know what it was, we heard another hit. But then after a few minutes, I noticed the oil pressure just going down, down, and the noises coming out of this thing. And the pilot says, look, I think we're going to have to put this thing down. And we had a, a lynx on our side just flying just to protect us. And so we went, and as we landed, the engine seized. And um, we uh, asked for a new engine to be uh, uh, sent to us from um, New Serum. And... Um, there happened to be one in Mount Darwin, which wasn't too far away. Uh, so I stripped the engine so long and um, uh, to get the new one on. And an engine change normally takes you a day, a day and a half. Um, I did it in three hours with, with uh, one of the blokes to help us. We didn't put the exhaust shrouds on or the elephant ears for the air filters, just basic, and we just flew it uh, so that we could uh, uh, get back. So, uh, you know, it was uh, nice that we, we were able to survive it um, and, um, and, and that I'm able to sit here uh, <laughs> and tell you the story. Um, <laughs> our role on Seven Squadron was multiple. And one of the times I remember we were in a, a, a contact area and... Uh, we got wind in Bandura. Um, there's a river that runs next to the town. It burst its banks, and there were um, there was a couple of kids, and uh, they were uh, they were rescued. But there was one where the trees uh, where the river had flooded, and this young boy was in the trees. And we could barely see him because it was uh, nightfall was coming. Now the whole town arrived to watch us. And when we arrived, the yellow light was flickering and we had no fuel. And we had hot faction gear was um, stuff we used to use. It was like um, about 40 feet, or like a rope. And they... Um, what do you call it, the, uh, like a pole, and the guys used to actually cl uh, click onto that. Uh, and when we would come and they were in trouble in hot extraction, they just click and click in and we'd uh, pull power and, and take them out. So the only thing that we had to get him out was the hot extraction gear. And I had one bloke on the end of the hot extraction gear, uh, and he was to go in between the trees and pull this, kid out. Now, bearing in mind, there was a civvy aircraft that had tried there for hours to get him out and couldn't get him out. And we had 10 minutes fuel. And the pilot said to me, you better get him out. So 
we go out, we go up, and we start going uh, to where the area is in amongst the, uh, the uh, raging water and the tree. And man, I'm battling to see, battling to see this uh, child. And just the whole town uh, hoping on us pulling this poor kid out uh, on, on the banks. And I couldn't, the, uh, with the guy being on the back, comes a pendulum effect, move forward one, and he goes forward 20 meters and then comes back. And eventually, uh, the guy got uh, uh, managed to grab the tree, and I said, down and down, and I couldn't see any more. And he said, the pilot said, we're going to have to go now. We've got no fuel. So I just prayed, and I saw um, uh, this guy, John Connolly, and he was a toughie. I thought I saw his thumb uh, come up, and I said, pull power. I couldn't see, and he pulled power, and he grabbed this young boy on the end of his fingers. And we went uh, and dropped him on the banks of the uh, uh, raging river uh, to big claps from everybody there. But I got into trouble because I didn't do it fast enough. So, uh, you know, those are the, the type of things that we had to do, um, which was not um, uh, uh, fighting the war only. Uh, and, you know, we came away uh, earlier from a contact to come and help this kid. That was the importance sure. that we put on life. Yeah, yeah. And, John, that's just a few things that I can remember. My memory's gone, mate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's been very interesting, uh, George, and uh, I'm sure you've got lots more stories that you'll probably recall as time goes by, I know that I know Tian's kept on saying, "Oh, and there's another story." Oh, and there's another story. <laughs> so so yeah. maybe, so maybe we'll we'll get some more from you. Were you um, friends with see, uh, Beaver Beaver Shaw? Yes, yes, Beaver Shaw. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I was friends with Beaver. Um, okay. You know, we, we were a small squadron. There was only about thirty of us technicians on the ground. Uh, we were very short of staff, but we were assisted yeah. by the ex technicians that used to be on the squadrons when they came in for call-up. If we yeah. didn't have them, we would have been in serious trouble. Yeah. Um, and, and they came in and helped us. But uh, yeah, I, I, I knew Beaver well, yeah. yeah. Did, you, did you ever get to spend time as a KCAR tech? Yes, yes. Um, in fact, I'll tell you a, a story. Um, there was a extra uh, um, um rugby player, we were, were going into um, Mozambique with the SAS and uh, we had uh, three G cars and I was on K car. And uh, when you go with K car, you always have more fuel than the G cars um, because you got to be there longer and also um, uh, the weight of the um, G cars with all the troops and their um, MAGs and all the rest was was very heavy. So I was on K car and in this area it was just bush all over the shop and we couldn't get uh, LZs to land. So eventually we found them and as we were flying back to Rhodesia, um, we we got wind that one of the guys was shot. So in the car with the fuel, we went back to uh, Kazabaki. But when we got there, I could see him standing up and he was the loot in charge of uh, the operation. We couldn't land anywhere near him. So I had to go on the steps and um, link my feet into the steps. Um, and then uh, we landed a little far, uh, uh, further away. I put my feet in. And then uh, we went and our monkey gripped him when we got to him because we couldn't come down. And we went back to the place where I put my feet in. And he had uh, a neck wound. It wasn't too serious. It uh, came through. So I took my mutton cloth and tied it around him. He looked like Bin Laden with his uh, scarf around him there. And it was just blood. But while we were doing this, as we got airborne, there was a tank. And this tank was giving us a hard time. So I gave him a few slot squares, the tank, and it, it followed us around. 
And as I was carrying on uh, uh, shooting it, all of a sudden, I, I saw the barrel come down, stop shooting. Now, you know, with a 20 mil, it won't go through a cannon. But I don't know what we did, but it stopped. And as it stopped, we saw this aircraft firing at us, a jet. Um, and uh, so with that, the pilot said, right, let's give him a go. So we, we pulled power, but varying in mind that uh, with the 20 mil, you shoot down, you don't shoot up. And the aircraft was up, so he had to fly the chopper on its side. And I started to give this uh, jet uh, some hang with a cake, and we were banging this thing. And all of a sudden, you could see that the banging was coming, the firing stopped, and this thing turned around. And, and, and flew away. We called for the hunters, and the hunters were there about 20 minutes or something later. And it was very reassuring to have the hunters there. And um, we got back, and I, I know we got back to uh, a place called uh, Marymount. So wherever that was in Mozambique, um, uh, it was probably about 40 minutes flight uh, into and 40 minutes back, somewhere around there. And um, we found out that it was Cubans that had the base camp. Okay. And uh, the 60 Salus, I mean, the 60 SAS sorted them out in uh, about five hours, one injury in the neck. Sure. Um, and uh, so, you know, when we as Rhodesians went in, we weren't softies. No, no that's for sure. See, what it a was story, yeah. Strong firepower. <laughs> yeah. Fighting yeah, that, that, that you asking me a question with a K car. <laughs> yeah, fighting tanks yeah. and jets. Um, yeah, no, because it's, it sounded like, you know, in the beginning you were stuck on day one in the K car and then you ended up being on G cars and you didn't say anything more about K cars. So I just wondered if you spent time as a K car gunner. Um, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, I did because. I was on the squadron for three years and uh, I actually injured my, my back in a contact and that's why I really came off is, uh, and that uh, today I still suffer uh, with the same um, effects but you know you just got to live with it um, mm. but um, uh, KCOS yeah I, I put it this way it wasn't my favorite um, oh, really? a, a gang on KCOS Look, there were nice uh, conveniences being on KCOS because you never had to collect bodies or parachutes and uh, 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 lousy things of mopping up after a, a contact. You just go and fly a, a back and clean your aircraft and uh, rearm it. Um, so there was that. But yeah, and generally for a KCOS, um, the KCOS was the senior pilot and the senior tech. That's how it operated. But sometimes, you know, a, a pilot that you're flying with and he gets on with you, uh, you go straight on to KCAR uh, above the senior pilot. But uh, um, that's how it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, George, thanks so much for your time, bro. And uh, it was so impromptu. Uh, um, we, we organized this whole interview in such a, in such a hurry. But uh, yeah. I, I really appreciate your time. And... Um, you know, um, maybe if you if you want to have another session, just let me know, and we can yeah, we can okay, reconvene. Yeah. You know, there, there's a lot of things that I haven't said. Um, I, I battle to to say them, and um, um, you know, I, I, I might just say this uh, in ending. Uh, two weeks ago, um, there were uh, a few of us ex techs. Um, there's in Australia, in WA, there's one of the original Rhodesian um, Bell 205s, the Huey, that's yeah. here, and, and, and an Aussie guy's bought it. And guess what? It's still in the Rhodesian colors. It's absolutely as it was. And seeing it was quite something. Sure. Uh, so that we enjoyed two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So much so yeah. that one of the pilots wants to buy it off him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate the input we've had from 
from the Air Force guys. I mean, we've had some brilliant um, um, interviews with the Air Force guys from from uh, Hugh Slatter all the way, you know, Tol Yannicka and... Uh, and um, uh, they were just, great bosses. Yeah, all the way down to 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 Tiens and to Engelbrecht. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, another another guy who's got wonderful stories is old Pete Simmons. You know, I don't know if you ever met Pete. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I sometimes go stay on his farm. He lives just down the road from me. Okay, some, now he's got some guest his, cottages. So his sister. Uh, I mean, his wife's brother um, uh, is one of my best friends who was a pilot uh, uh, in uh, Rhodesia on helicopters and also mirages and all that, um, Steve Murray. Uh, and we okay. talk to one another just about daily. And, <laughs> well, uh, his sister married uh, Pete Simmons, yeah. So, yeah, yeah he's just story, written a yeah. book. Um, he's got lots of stories. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thanks, and, uh, George. Let me stop recording now. Uh...